Coming up next, I'll share some secrets that'll help you get hired even in the downturn. And what is the key to staying with it? We'll take your calls and your chats, and it starts right now. I'm coming to you live from Ramsey Studios in Nashville, and you're joining a conversation about who you are, what you are created to do, where you can do it, where you want to do it, and the most important part, how do you get there? How do you make that dream job a reality? So excited to have you with us. We are here for you because of how important you are. You were created to fill a unique role. In other words, you were created to contribute, and we're going to look at the work side of that. You're not a one-dimensional person. However, we all desire to make a difference, to make a contribution, and our work is a huge part of our lives, and thus a huge portion of our contribution. So let's help you figure that out. There's seven stages to meaningful work. Stage one is get clear. Stage two is get qualified. Stage three is get connected. Stage four is get started. Stage five, get promoted. Stage six, get your dream job. Stage seven, give yourself away. What stage are you in? We'll help you figure out what that is and how you can get to the next stage. A couple ways to engage. 844-747-2577. That's the phone number. We're going to put it on the screen. 844-747-2577. 2577. You're watching on YouTube live or on demand later. You call in. Now, if you're watching live, Madison is standing by. Phone lines are open. You're one phone call away. Oh, Ken, I'm nervous. I get it. I'm going to take good care of you. We're not going to make fun of you. I'm going to ask all the questions. You've got the answers, and I'll dig a little bit to help you find the answers. If you're watching this when it's not, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're watching, obviously, on demand later. But you can get us Monday through Friday, 12 Eastern Time, right here on our YouTube live stream show. Also, the podcast of the Ken Coleman syndicated radio show and Sirius XM show is available wherever you listen to podcasts. And you can listen on your local radio station all around the country, kencoleman.com, to find out all the ways to listen and share the show. So today's article I want to focus on from Fast Company, Secrets to Getting Hired During an Economic Downturn. I came into the studio today about 10 minutes ago, and I was telling Joe and Madison how excited I was about this information. Folks, if you're looking for some good news, period, this article is good news. But if you're looking for good news for you and your career, This is incredible news. According to a recent study by the Society for Human Resource Management, 17% of employers are expanding their businesses and 13% are hiring. Now, you're going, 17 and 13, folks, that's much higher than I thought it would be. Then, in addition, PwC does an annual global CEO survey, and they recently did this survey and found that 74% of CEOs are concerned about the availability of their employees' skills. So in other words, they look at their company and they go, we need more skilled people. Boy, that's good news. So companies need more skill to grow as a result of pivoting, new initiatives, new ways of doing business, and so now's the time for you to step up. So here are, in this article, and I want to give credit to the uh, author here, Tracy Brower from Fast Company. Really good stuff. Set the bar high, she says. During tough times, you're going to have to be among the best in your area. So update your skills, add new skills. Two, really give energy to connecting We talk about this all the time on this program. Get around people who are doing what you want to do. Get in places where you're going to meet those people. And really, really, really work your web of connections. Third, take on a true inventive mindset. How about recommending a role? Instead of applying for a role that's open, what about recommending a role? This is where I think a recruiter would be a tremendous asset. They've got the relationships and the connections and can make the pitch on your behalf. 
Come up with a position. This is where you use the web of connections, your relationships and acquaintances to get in front of a company and say, look, I think the position that I can do would actually really benefit you. Uh, four, articulate your fit. This is really talking about the role you play. That's why we talk about the role you fill in the workplace. Your role can be filled through multiple jobs. Really explain in your resume, the way we give you the resume guide, it'll set you up to do this. Set yourself out, set yourself apart by a compelling description of the role that you fit. Um, five, attract recruiters with a very specific customized resume. Customize. Sometimes we get this call or email, Ken, do I really have to customize my resume for every job? Yes. Yeah. Your resume is a brochure. You better make sure that it hits the mark. And then finally, demonstrate that you can roll with the punches. Isn't that funny, Joe? We've been talking about that phrase. I kind of explained it, I think, on last week's show. It's an old phrase. It comes from the boxing world. Uh, but this is about adaptability, which is a huge quality. Listen to this. The study that I quoted earlier in the article from Society of Human Resource Management found that 10% of employers are in the process of beginning new initiatives. And that same study by PwC of CEOs found that 55% of CEOs believe they cannot innovate. And 44% of CEOs don't believe they can pursue new business opportunities because they don't have people to skills. Hello, people with skills. Now's the time to ring the dinner bell. You know, this is exciting. This is good stuff. And the Ken Coleman Show is here for you in this process. 844-747-2577, 844-747-2577. Let's go to Marie, who starts us off in Boston, Massachusetts. Marie, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi, Ken. How are you? Marie, I'm living the dream, and I'm a little fired up today, so I'm ready to help. Oh, awesome. Okay, great. Um, so I started working for a consultant agency back in 2013, and the first company I was placed at um, I was supposed to be there for about a month, and fast forward now, it'll be seven years that I have been there this wow. October. Um, so a couple of years in, I had asked um, my agency, I don't really have a lot of contact with them unless I reach out to them. Mm -hmm. So I had asked them you know, for review if I could get an increase, which they did, but it was very small. And then as a consultant, I get a lot of um, emails and calls from other recruiters with job opportunities. And back in 2017, I went on a couple of interviews and got offered actually um, two positions. So I went back to my agency and let them know. And they basically asked me what would it take to get you to stay. So I really had a lot of leverage and ended up with a uh, almost $15,000 uh, annual raise. Wow. So I kind of feel like now it's been three years. Do I have, I almost feel like, do I even have a right to ever even ask again? How would I go about doing that? And um, kind of what would I say? Yeah. So this is an interesting situation because here's what I teach and I want to apply that to your situation. What I teach people is never to ask directly for a raise because it, it, it mm -hmm. just, it just rarely works. Because it just has the effect of putting the leadership that you're taking this to on the defensive. Right. Um, and what you want to do is be in a situation where you have an annual review, which we have at Ramsey Solutions. And the annual review is to go over the key responsibility areas, which is a one sheet description of what each person here at Ramsey Solutions is being expected to perform well in. Right. So it's got this list and this is what we expect from you. Or we expect we expect these things to be done and done well. And so when you have an annual review process that you can combine with, hey, how can I grow? So in these annual reviews, you're going, where are some th some areas that I can grow in a positive way? Meaning if I grow here, it makes me more valuable to the organization. And with more value to the organization comes more responsibility. And with more responsibility, mm -hmm. more pay. You see how that works. But we're not yeah. framing the conversation in, hey, it's been three years, I'd like a raise. because So right. that's what I teach, number one. Now let's lay that over your reality. You went to them with this idea before, and they basically didn't do anything. When you said, hey, mm -hmm. can, I, can I have a review? Yeah, that's essentially what you were saying, and they didn't do much. Only when you went out and, and basically, or recruiters came to you, and you had all this leverage because of real job offers, did they then go, oh, what can we do to keep you? 
So they're not in a very good, healthy leadership space to be talking with you every year going, great job, Marie. We've asked you to do this. You've exceeded this. Thus, we're going to um, reward you. That's not happening. Mm -hmm. So that leads me to believe it's not going to happen. Right. So the only way you get another substantial raise is if you got recruiters knocking down your door and you go back and play this leverage game. Right. Now, will that work? Actually, will that work again? What's your opinion on that? What do you think the chances of that happening just like that or very similar to that? Well, I actually still do have a lot of leverage because the company I'm working at, the project I'm on, just won another uh, bid for another six years. And if I do leave this company, my agency will not be able to replace me with another consultant because they are no longer using that agency. I'm basically the only one left there um well then get rid of everybody else okay so you've got leverage but but here's what i want you to do i don't want you to use the leverage for just another big bump i want you to say i i'm crushing it for you guys can Mm -hmm. we not institute a yearly review where i'm up for a raise based on my performance and you guys are the ones that put the measurables out there and we agree on the measurables right don't you think that's the better way to go? Just I'm asking you how you feel about that as opposed to being in this, gee whiz, here we go, three years without a raise and I got to go back and play this poker game again. Oh, definitely. I mean, I, I never hear from them at all. In fact, even since this COVID started, I haven't heard from them once. Like they haven't even checked in. You know what you know, that tells me? Uh, how are you doing? You know, are you even alive? You know, nothing. It's you know what so, that tells um, me? That tells me you need to be looking to leave. Yeah. But now, you didn't call me about that. You said, what do I do to talk raise? I think you use the leverage, but you say, guys, I, I want to process here. You know, right. I'm crushing it for you. But to where me, I am working now, the company is, you know, it's great. Like I'm, Yeah, but you're you know, not working for the company. You're working for exactly. this agency. Right. I wonder if you don't just say to the company, hey, let me, let me shoot straight with you. You guys happy with my performance? What are they going to say? Mm-hmm. What are they going to say if you ask them that? They would say, yes, definitely. You're doing a great job. And they've told me that in the past when I have reached out to them um, just to even ask for feedback. And I've actually asked that, you know, how am I doing? Do you think, you know, how are things going? Have you gotten any feedback from the client? I just don't know why you wouldn't enter into a, a what if. What if you work directly for them? What's the benefit for them paying your agency versus them just bringing you on board? I know the answer. They're not paying your yeah. benefits and all those other things. Um, mm-hmm. And it might be a policy. But anyway, here's my point. I don't want to get in the weeds. What I want you to hear me say is, beyond the strategy of what you need to do now, I want you thinking about the next. And I just yeah. I just want you in a place where you're valued and you've got a ladder that you're looking at all the time, not waiting three years to go, oh, exactly. by the way, you guys are aware that I'm still alive? Right. You know what I mean? And I don't feel valued, and I kind of feel like, um, you know, there's I, I'm at, I'm as high as I'm going to go with where I am right now. What do you uh, so What do I you said, What do you do? And are you considered uh, executive level or junior executive level, even though you're a consultant? I'm a senior um, financial analyst. Okay, and so what's the what would you and so you've got recruiters coming to you because you've already proven you're very impressive in the marketplace. They're hunting you down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even though you you leveraged those opportunities three years ago, were any of those opportunities attractive to you? Or were they just, nah, but I can use they them were. as leverage? They were. They had pros and cons. And at that time, I was at a place in my life where I needed flexibility. And starting a new job, it would be difficult to get I that. Get, I get it's it. Where I am now, you know, I can kind of, yeah. I almost kind of work on my own. And I just, it wasn't a good uh it wouldn't have been best at that time. Yeah. Well, good for you. Marie, you know how much you're worth. You know you matter. I'm on Team Marie. I want you making a really good decision to where you go to a place where they go, Marie's a stinking rock star. She's got mm-hmm. she's got no limits to what she can do. And I want people to see you that way. And there are companies that will see you that way. So I think you start finding those and you tell these other folks, I'm out. That's what I think. Right. Yeah. But, but take your time with it. You're not in a rush. But let's go find mm-hmm. some better options. Let's call those recruiters back. You know? Right. I agree. Yeah. It's all on you. You got this. It's time for you to say goodbye. It's time. You know? Go where somebody loves you. Life's too short to to just be a an asset to a company. 
Um, it's just not. It, it's just not sustainable. Eight four four seven four seven two five seven seven. Let's go to Corpus Christi, Texas, next, where Casey is. Casey, you're on the Ken Coleman show. Hey Ken, thanks for taking my call. You bet. How can I help? Uh, so I've got my first real adult job interview tomorrow, and I'm not really sure how to uh, strike a balance between conveying that I'm serious and professional, which is how I want to convey myself, but also that I have a I have a personality and that I'd be a good fit in terms of like relationship wise within the company, like between people, you know, like a team dynamic thing. Yeah. That's really simple. Make sure that you smile, make sure that you enjoy yourself and show some enthusiasm, but all of your answers, but all of your answers are serious answers in that you're not goofing off. If you want to come across as professional, pay attention to the questions, answer the questions, but smile have fun and show some genuine enthusiasm and gratitude to be there. So gratitude is you just tell them how thankful you are for the opportunity with a big smile on your face. And then you show enthusiasm throughout the entire interview from the moment you walk in the office and shake their hand or bump their fist or bump the elbow, whatever people are doing these days. Okay. But the reality is, is that you don't have to overthink this. Um, but you want them to be, you want them to be not just impressed with your, your answers and that you are a classy individual, which is being a professional. Um, but you also want to be likable and that combination of likable and what we'll say serious, meaning you're not got a dour look on your face, but you, you know, you're, you're engaged. Have you seen my, how to win the interview guide at Ken I'm not. All right. So here's what I want you to do. Uh, I want you to go to Ken and I want you to download this thing. How many hours or what? how much time do you have before you step into this interview? Uh, 24 hours. Oh, fantastic. I want you to go to KenColeman.com, all right? And okay. I want you to go to resources, and you will see the, uh, the Get Hired Guides, and one of them is How to Win the Interview. I want you to download this. It's a very simple, easy-to-read PDF, but it's going to prepare you mentally for this interview, Okay. And it's also okay. going to prepare you on what clothes to wear, you know, because you want to make sure you dress like these people dress. You hear me? Don't overdress. Yes. Don't wear a suit and tie yes, if they all wear golf shirts and khakis. Dress like if somebody saw you walking through the halls, they, they think you were a new employee. All right. And I'm going okay. to teach you some body language stuff in this guide. Um, and I'm going to teach you... Um, how to think of questions that you will ask in the interview that make you look professional, okay? And then we'll tell you what questions to expect, okay? So, uh, sorry, Joe. my uh, I didn't turn the uh, volume down on my uh, computer, so we got a little chat in there. Uh, so, anyway, uh, that's all you need to do is read the guide and do what I tell you to do, and you're going to be ready to go. Casey, you got this, man. And listen, listen, expect the best. Don't go into this interview thinking, well, I hope I don't screw it up think i'm gonna go in and really crush this even though it's my first interview i got ken's how to win the interview guide i'm prepared now i'm ready to perform you got it i got it thanks ken all right buddy appreciate you and by the way if you get the job will you call us back and tell us a hundred percent yeah that'd be really know. fun find out today i'll let you know tomorrow yeah you know why it'd be really fun for other young people and parents of young people to hear how you handled your first ever job interview based on some of the stuff we talked about all right all right. Go, Casey, go. 844-747-2577. 844-747-2577. All right, let's go to the chat room. Uh, Luis writes in, Hey, Ken, I'm wanting to switch to a new job. However, I'm currently working to pay off debt. My current job really helps me with that. I'm afraid if I leave paying off, if I leave this job, paying off my debt will be effective. What should I do? Okay. Let's uh, first of all, let's take a deep breath and let's think logically. All right. You want to switch to a new job. You know all the reasons why. That's a really smart decision. And you should make the switch. The question is, when is the right time to make the switch? And that is answered by simply going, if I switch to a new job that I desire, that I've identified and, I've, and I'm qualified and I'm ready to go, does that new job pay me the same or more as my current job? If the answer is no, then we go, whoa. All right? It's very simple. Because we go, 
if I take a cut, this is going to make my debt payoff plan slow down. And that's not the right decision there. I would rather you wait to step into the work you love than wait to pay off the debt. I really believe that paying off the debt is the first step. I really do. But if you can find a job or work that you want to do that pays you the same amount of money, then you make the switch. You're making the same amount of money. So there's no risk here. So that's it. That's all you do. Uh, Eric writes in, how do I deal with a toxic coworker? Um, pretty simple. Two-step process. Well, let's call it a three-step process. First step, I would go talk to the toxic coworker. I just believe in the one-to-one. Um, and I go to them and go, hey, um, I don't want this to be any more uncomfortable than it needs to be. Um, but this is what you're doing. Are you aware that, that what you're, that this is what you're doing? This is how this is coming across. Don't put them, you know, don't, don't say you're doing this and this is wrong and you need to stop. Just say, are you aware of this? And they're going to receive that one of two ways, either in a good way, go, oh, I didn't realize that. Thanks for telling me. Or I don't have no idea what you're talking about, man. Go pound sand. And uh, good grief, Joe. Now I've got it turned off. There it is. That kind of stuff, folks, just so you know. This is this is literally what it's like. Joe is back there. And I'm Joe. Okay. This is this is fun. Little ADHD moment. Joe's right here. He's watching the board and everything. He hears one, like if I hit the mic or I... I uh, turn a page in my book or a beep like that goes off. This is what it looks like. He's here. He's watching. Joe's very attentive. He's like on it. And then all of a sudden, that's what I see through the glass. So this is why I have to apologize to Joe because he's on it. Like he's he's on it. And I got to explain to him. And so, Joe, I'm sorry. Two ringy dingies? I apologize. <laughs> it's fine, sir. All right. So back to the thing here on the toxic worker. First step. I would very lightly confront. Just say, are you aware of this? And I'm only bringing this up because I, I just think you should know and I want to be helpful. I do not want to offend you in any way. Now, a lot of people do not like this first step. And if you don't, I'm going to tell you, you don't have to do it. This is what I would do. Okay. Depending on how that conversation goes, if it doesn't change, you take it to your leader. Or if you don't like that step, go right to the leader. You can start with step two, which is go to the leader and go, look, this is what's going on. This coworker's toxic. Here's how it's affecting everybody. I just want you to be aware of it. And and then we see what the what the leader does. If the leader doesn't fix it and it's affecting you to a point where you don't think you can put up with it much longer and it's affecting your productivity and and your spirit, then it's time for you to find another place to go, unfortunately. Now, I want to give you one other option there in step three. If it's not handled, it's not dealt with, and you have the ability to go, all right, I like where I'm at. I can't leave right now or whatever reason for which you would say, I'm going to have to deal with this, then go, can I deal with it? And the answer is yes, you can deal with it. And you've got to come up with a way where you ignore it, you put a fence around it somehow, and you just focus on other things. That's the only option you have if you don't want to leave or you can't leave. So there you go. 844-747-2577. So what's the key to staying on this path, this path that can be full of winding turns and detours and potholes? This path to living and working on purpose is a journey. Some people do it faster than others. We don't know the timeline many times. We, we can plan for a timeline. We can desire a timeline, but we really don't know. We can't control it. And I'm more speaking to those of you who are in those early days. You're in stage two and three and four, which is get qualified, get connected, get started. Um, and you're hoping to get, if you're in that get started or you've already started and now you're in between get started and get promoted, you want to get promoted. It's not happening fast enough. And you're like, good grief, how much longer I got to wait? I feel like I'm, 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 I'm just barely hanging on. Okay, that's who I'm talking to. What's the key? What is the mindset to staying with it? 
or as I say many times on this show, to keep on keeping on. How do you do that? You can't just gut that out. You got to have a real focus. So here's a little phrase I gave my kids, and this is for dealing with anxiety uh, around the job, uh, you know, dealing with fear of messing up, doubt that you can't do it, all those things, plus just the agonizing weight for what you want to happen. And you're just chopping wood and nobody sees. You can't chop that tree down. It's taking forever to chop the tree down. I was reminded of this last night, Joe and Madison. I walked into my daughter's bathroom, Josie. She is a sixth grader. And you ever have those moments, parents, where you said something and maybe you said it for a while, maybe you only said it once and you knew it mattered to you and you wanted your kids to get it, but you don't know if they got it. And then somehow it pops back up in conversation or somewhere else and you go, oh my gosh, they got it. Madison, your parents did this. I know you're, you're a wonderful kid. I know your mom and dad, Mike and Casey, they're great people. They, they, they would be shaking their heads right now. They'd be going, okay, yeah, I remember that a few times. Probably more with Madison than her brothers, if I'm being honest, but you know. I am the best child. I know. I knew this is why I said this. I feel like I risked upsetting your brothers who I don't even know just to kind of kiss up to you, but, but nonetheless. So I'm walking into my daughter's bathroom last night. I always go in and pray with the kids before bed and hang out with them a little bit. And so I go in to uh, turn my daughter's bathroom light off. And on the mirror, Joe, she has taken a dry erase marker and she wrote these words, which is the lesson today. This is what I saw. I walked in and I see on her bathroom mirror says, do your best, forget the rest. Wow. I got a little, I got a little, I got a little dusty eyed. Oh, yeah. Because I looked at that and I went, that's something that I said. Now, Madison, Joe, you've heard me say that before. Yes. Once or twice. But it's been several years. Okay. I said it in the early days of the program because I was in that season with my kids where they're worried about their school grades. They're worried about this test, you know, and I'd be like, look, do your best. Forget the rest. Do your best. Don't worry about everybody else's grade. Do your best. Uh, And this is the message to you all today. Hey, If you're not getting there as fast as you want to get there, you haven't seen the opportunity present itself yet, here's the deal. Do your best, forget the rest. Forget about the timing. You can't control it anyway. What you can't control is you doing your best. Keep on keeping on. Keep on showing up. Keep on iterating. Keep on knocking on doors. Keep on making cold calls. Keep on speaking. Whatever it is. Keep on writing. Keep on creating. Keep on studying. Keep on connecting. How do you do that? The mindset of, you know what? I'm going to do my best and forget everything else. Laser focus. Laser focus. Do your best. Forget the rest. And if you do that, if that becomes your motto, and I really want that to come back alive, because it's one of those things where I was like, for whatever reason, Josie got that message. I mean, it's been a couple years since I've even said that to my kids. And she remembered it going into sixth grade, middle school, a lot of anxiety in middle school. By the way, Nathan, you got that to look forward to. One of the toughest things you'll deal with as a dad is when your kids get in middle school and they start comparing themselves to everybody. It's just natural. It's a hormone thing. It's a rite of passage age thing. And it's, it's, it's unbelievable, man. And that message, do your best, forget the rest was for the boys. So I give it to you all. Do your best, forget the rest. It's a wonderful, simple motto that I want you to grab onto. So there you go. 844-747-2577. You know, one little thing here too, Nathan. Nathan's got little kids, so I'm talking to my my director. You've got youngsters uh, and you're probably starting to feel like it, but when you get your kids get a little older, like elementary school and then beyond. And my oldest is 14, so I'm in this, I'm in the middle of this deal. So many times I'm reminded that I'm just, gee whiz, this, this father stuff is hard. This parenting stuff is hard, and I'm not doing a great job of it. What are you laughing at? Madison's back there laughing. Well, I mean, it just was funny. It is. Of course it's hard. I know, but my point is it's really hard. Okay? I, I wouldn't know. I know you don't know. Not a parent. Mike would know. 
We should get Mike on the phone sometime. He'd love to call in the show and tell us about Madison. But anyway, oh, man. here's the point, Nathan, is that every once in a while you realize, oh, okay, I did something that kind of stuck and it worked. And that keeps you going. Because being a dad is really hard. Being a mom is even harder, right? Mm -hmm. Mad respect for all the moms out there. Oh, yeah. But uh, every once in a while, something sticks. And I'm telling you, folks, you let that stick, it's going to help you. Tested with a sixth grader who heard it when she was a third grader for the first time. Good stuff. Good stuff. 844-747-2577. All right, let's go to Rachel next in Redmond, California. Rachel, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi, Ken. Um, so I am 48 years old and trying to re-enter the workforce. Um, my husband, who was our sole provider, um, recently passed away. And oh, so I'm trying to be no. forced into going back to work. Oh. And I'm not quite sure how to navigate this at my age. Yeah. Oh, Rachel, I'm so sorry. How long ago did your husband pass away? Um, Like um, seven weeks ago. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um. So, first of all, you need to acknowledge that making big decisions about work right now is going to be probably a little bit more confusing just because of the sheer loss that you're suffering from. I mean, this has just rocked your world. So, mm -hmm. what we're going to try to do on this call is identify some maybe big rocks, if you will, to kind of mm -hmm. get a general idea and but know that i want you to give yourself some grace on any decisions you need to make in the next I have time good how I much time? time that was my next question how much time do you have probably um like two years to three two to three years before i'm going to be like really forced to okay. make some big decisions okay now that is incredible news so rachel i literally mm -hmm. want you to take a deep breath right now take a deep breath okay because listen it's not going to take you two years. So this is huge. This is what this means, Rachel, is that you don't have to make a decision under any kind of pressure and you need to, we're going to, I'm going to prescribe to you. We're going to get into this in a second, but my, my goal is, is to give you some ideas to go run down and test and learn a little bit more mm -hmm. as you're healing from this. Okay. And then you are going to heal. And when you get on the other side of this, it's going to be easier to make some decisions. So I'm really thrilled with our timeline here. Um, let's start with the big question. When you were younger, or at any point in your 48 years, mm -hmm. have there been times where you have wondered about, well, I wonder what this work would be like? Or you had the question that we've all heard, and that I ask all the time, which is if money wasn't an issue and I just wanted to work for the sheer joy of contribution, what is it that I would want to do? Has anything ever popped in your mind there? Tell me what you got. Um, well, when I was working, I was working on helping people in finding employment. So that's why it's so odd that I'm in this position now. And I would help them get into um, interviews and um dressing and questions interesting and really what was the that. what was the position was it recruiting it was working um for the county as a employment specialist oh. and um, people who were on public assistance or employers who were coming into our um into our county who needed um, love that to have how long workers, ago was that it. it was a long time it was about 16 years ago okay and so you've been staying home since then yeah. Yeah. But well, I've worked part time and yeah. in sales, but right. I don't like sales. No, I get it. Okay. So here's the deal. One thing I want to make sure you hear right now just because you've only done part time work over the last 16 years, you know that doesn't make you useless and irrelevant. Do you understand that? <sighs> no, not yet. I'll get there. I know. But, but that's why I'm telling you hear me on this because here's what you bring to the table you bring talent to the table. You also bring passion to the table because there's work out there that you really love. We've already identified something you liked a lot. Yeah. Okay. And then you also have experience. So you are not irrelevant. Don't you worry a bit about the uh, work gap. Okay. I'll address that a little bit later. All right. So let's go into this. So if we were just having fun, Rachel, and we were going, there's no pressure. We've got two years to decide. Um. Uh, 
What would you try first? Would you go back to that kind of work you did before? Or is there something else where you go, I think I'd try this if I knew I couldn't fail and I didn't have to commit to it for the next 10, 12, 15 years. What would you try? I would try, since I volunteered at nonprofits, I kind of enjoyed working with nonprofits that help children. I love that. That's your heart, right? Yeah. Tell me the why behind that. Why would you work for a nonprofit that helps children? And in what ways would they help children where you go, my goodness, I get to be a part of this organization that does this for kids. What is it? Um, just the thankfulness that comes from the families in which you're helping. It just is rewarding. Yeah. I love that. You know, there's a theme here. Have you seen the theme between what you did before that you liked where you were basically offering career guidance, job guidance to people, and then this this, this, uh, this other vision you've got? Do you see the thread? What's the thread? Helping people. That's it. But it's not just helping people. There's a specific way you like to help people. If, you were, if I was going to make you give me a one-word descriptor of the role you were playing, so let's say this was a TV show about your life, and when you were doing, what, what's the role? What's the role you're playing in both of those jobs you've told us about? Give me a one-word descriptor. There's no wrong answer. Helper, I don't know. Yeah, it's perfect. Guide. I think it's a guide. Guide. Do you agree okay. with that word? Yeah. Because what does a guide do? Describe to me what you think a guide does. Shows people a path to get out of a bad situation yeah. or yeah. Better, get them into a better situation. Yeah. Right. If I hired a guide to lead me up a mountain, the guide is not just going to uh, show me the best path. The guide is also going to show me some techniques, right? The guide's going to yeah. tell me about some resources I need to be able to get up the mountain. So you play that role. That's the role you have played. And I think it's the role you're describing right now. Yeah. Do you see that? I do. I see it, but I just don't know. I, every time I look for jobs now, everyone wants this higher education, and I stopped going to school when yeah. I was younger because I was raising my family. Well, wait a second. They didn't need higher education when you did it for the county before. The county's still there. It's still there, but they've changed requirements and so okay. many different All right. Positions. All right, so here's the deal. Don't let that be a deterrent because I'm telling you not every job that would allow you to play the role of helping guide is going to require a degree how much money will you think you need to make what will be the number that you've got in your head that you go if i'm making this i'm i'm taking care of the basic needs and i'm not touching retirement and i'm good what's that number like 60 to seventy thousand a year okay so that's you've got two years all right to figure mm -hmm. this out we got plenty of time you're not behind the eight ball but i right. want you to start doing your homework on jobs first let's just look at jobs and industries in your area where you can play that role of advisor and guide, maybe even a little bit of a coach, right? Because mm -hmm. that's what you've been doing. And so I can tell you right now, the nonprofits, you're, I don't know that nonprofits are going to pay that kind of money, but you need to look mm -hmm. into it. But what right. you need to do is not limit yourself to a nonprofit, but say, where are all the positions in my area where I'm playing that role of advisor slash guide and just helping people get out of a problem area and move on. Cause I think that's what really drives you. Yeah. Okay. So you're pretty you clear. Correct. I think you're just doubtful that you can get there. And I think that you well, listen to me. You don't have to have a degree in all these positions. What you have to have is a connection. Okay. You've got connections, Rachel. How long have you been living in your area? Uh, 21 years. How many people do you think you know on an acquaintance level or a true, I've got a true friendship level? How many people? Give me a round number. A thousand probably. Yeah, a thousand people. Now this gets fun, Rachel. How many people do you think those thousand people know? All of them. How many do each of those a thousand people know? Equal, if not more. Yeah. Have you done the math on that real quick? <laughs> there yeah, we go. We got, a, we got a chuckle. Here's the point. I'm going to give you a copy, whatever format you want, either the written or the ebook. Uh, so hard copy, ebook, or audio book of my number one best-selling book, The Proximity Principle, which unpacks yeah. the proximity principle itself, which says in order to do what Rachel wants to do, she's got to be around people that are mm -hmm. doing that work. She's got to be in places where she meets those people who are doing that work, right? 
Right. And that's where you get opportunities that they don't care about your resume. They go, oh, Rachel's awesome. And your web of connections, which is a chapter in that book, that that thousand people times a thousand times a thousand, you start running that out and you have two years, plenty of time to make viable connections to where people go, hey, we get it. You've been home for 16 years doing a little bit of part time work. We're going to introduce you to the people who make the decision. We're going to vouch for you. It's all about connections. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, listen. Okay. You got this, okay? So hang on the line. Madison's going to okay. give you the book. I want you to read it, and I want you to do it, okay? All and, right. and Thank then, you. And then here's the deal. Once you get started in this process, and you tell people the type of work you're looking for, and you tell everybody, and you keep telling everybody, and you make more connections, opportunities are going to knock on your door. I promise. Now, right now, your whole world's been rocked. Yeah. Okay? So even though you're understanding what I'm saying, I'm hearing you go, okay, Ken, and you're not believing it. (laughs) And listen, that's okay. Because the reason it's hard for you to believe right now is because your whole world went from certainty to unbelievable, heartbreaking uncertainty. And you're surrounded by that fog right now. That fog is going to lift. And when the fog lifts and take your time to heal, that's the most important thing. You're not in a panic. You don't need to jump right now. Just grieve. Do you hear me? Mm-hmm. Grieve. Okay. Fully grieve. And then coming out of the grief, and you will, the fog lifts. And you got the book, and you got plenty of connections. And I'm okay. telling you, the sun is going to come back up. You hear me? But I grieve for you, and I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank you. All right, Rachel. Thank you. You bet. All right. You got it. Ah, oh. it's important that those of you that are in Rachel's shoes or that you've got a friend or a loved one who's gone through a, a, just a, a loss like that, a loss of a loved one, that's just, it's just jarring. It's not a segmented hurt. It hurts everything. It covers everything. It is incredibly difficult to think clearly and act clearly when you're hurting so while we talk through things she needs to do i'm telling you if you are in her shoes like her rachel and you have got to get healthy and there's a time to hurt there's a time to recover after a surgery it just it don't feel good and what do you have to do we don't go back to work why we get we get we get healing we get some therapy And then we get back to full speed and that's where she's at. So it's really important. You get healthy first and then all this other stuff is a lot easier to do when you're healthy. Really appreciate all of you for listening and sharing your pain with us. We take it very seriously. Well, my time is almost up, but I want you to know before you go that you matter and you do have what it takes. Thank you for joining the conversation. Until next time, this is the Ken Coleman Show. Press on.